My name is Todd Kresner. I am the director of UCLA's Center for Jewish Studies and also professor here of Germanic Languages and Comparative Literature. And I'm delighted to uh, invite you today to really experience uh, a very innovative approach to looking at the history of Jewish Los Angeles. Um, I'm going to give you a couple words of introduction about this project. And this is, in many ways, a very different kind of presentation than I think what you may be used to getting when you come to the center, uh, where we often have wonderful um, scholars who have just finished tremendous works of historical work spent 10, 20 years working on it and are presenting it. We're giving you something that's a work in progress. Uh, it's basically almost like you might say an interim report. Uh, it's a project that we began uh, earlier this year. And it's a project which I had been wanting to work on for almost a decade and wasn't really able to do because we didn't quite have the right team. We didn't have uh, some of the funding we needed. We didn't really have the technologies. And all these things happily came together over the past year. Um, although there's still much to be done, and what we're going to present to you today is really, I think, the first stages, I think you already get a sense about what uh, a digital research project that truly wants to delve into the complex layers of Jewish LA might begin to look like. Um, so our team, uh, we have a team of people, and there are actually, uh, some of them are here, but there's actually many more partners that aren't here. Our team is innovative in some ways because we have undergraduates working with us, we have graduate students, we have postdocs, we have faculty. We have a team uh, from the Center for Jewish Studies, but we also have faculty who are in other departments, history and other places. We have community partners, uh, folks who are beyond and outside of UCLA. We have the library, uh, special collections at the library and all the resources that the UCLA library has to offer. And uh, more than that, we have the general public because many of you have stories that we're interested in learning about and also archiving. So this is a project that I mentioned that we've begun uh, just recently, but it's an initiative uh, to develop and help to, I guess you might say, excavate the buried layers of, of Jewish LA over about 150 years. In that regard, it's quite uh, ambitious. So just briefly, um, if you want, uh, all of the work that for this project can be found online. It's just called mappingjewishla.org. Uh, here you can find about the project. You can learn about the people who are involved with it. Uh, you can go and look at some of our exhibitions that we've developed. And our team will be telling you about some of these exhibitions today. One of the goals here is we're thinking really about what digital exhibitions might look like, particularly um, what would be called what might be called publications in the digital realm. And so it's easy enough to, I guess, publish a book, but a book you know, is, is finite and finished, doesn't have any music, doesn't have any video, uh, doesn't have interactive maps. All those things are affordances of the digital. And I should also say that we're working very closely with special collections here at UCLA. We're working closely with special collections at UCLA precisely because we have uh, resources here that haven't been tapped before. Uh, we've been spending a tremendous amount of time in the archives in order to find stuff that hasn't seen the light of day in 50 or 60 years. And so this is also really important, right? You have stuff that goes in an archive, but it becomes dormant. And what we're interested in doing is bringing it out because it's gonna illuminate some aspect of the culture, the society, the history, which has uh, heretofore been, I guess, somewhat invisible. So the digital exhibitions, we'll take you through some of them today. There's many more that we're uh, doing. And uh, without much further ado, I'm going to introduce the project team. They're all going to tell you a little bit about the project. Then we'll have time for Q&A, and we'll have a reception afterwards. So um, just introducing, not in the order they're going to speak, but just starting from Patrick right here. Uh, so Patrick Tran uh, was an undergraduate student of mine at UCLA. He's recently graduated on his way, I think, to medical school and uh, has been intimately involved with uh, the mapping uh, initiatives of our center. Um, Andy parallels, I guess you might say, this track as well, also on his way to medical school, learning a lot about Jewish LA and has been instrumental in developing interactive uh, technologies uh, for uh, making visible these paths. In the middle, uh, Karen Wilson, who's our Khan postdoctoral research fellow. Uh, she's here uh, this year and hopefully next as well. Um, finished a PhD in history, is herself, I think, uh, 
one of the foremost experts on Jewish LA and uh, is also the head, the guest curator at the Autry for a major physical exhibition that'll be opening in May. And the idea is that these two, the digital exhibition that we're creating and the physical exhibition that they're creating, there'll be a lot of synergies. The digital one will live on far beyond the exhibition of the physical space, um, but the physical one obviously allows you to go inside. So um, she's working on both. Uh, next to her, Carolyn Luce, uh, also a doctoral co candidate in history who's been working, delving into special collections here at UCLA. She's going to tell you about some of the findings that we've uh, uncovered and particularly showcase some of the really exciting things that, again, have been buried for, for years and years and now are coming to light and illuminating really important aspects of Jewish LA. And finally, um, Elliot uh, Yamamoto is an undergraduate, fourth year architecture and geography uh, student. He's been working on us creating uh, what's called geographic information systems maps. So basically taking demographic social science data and making maps to show uh, change over time. And he's going to showcase some of his work. One of the interesting things that you're going to see right away is that undergraduates are involved in research. This is not typical, um, except maybe in the sciences. Uh, when they are involved in the humanities, it's often, you know, go get that book for me or digitize this. Um, they are actually formulating research questions. They're doing investigative work. And in this regard, I think this is a model for a different kind of research uh, than what's traditionally been done in the humanities and something, honestly, I'm very, I'm very proud of. And they're extraordinary students. So with that, let me, um, I'm going to introduce Carolyn Luce, who's going to take us on a brief tour of some of the neglected and exciting aspects of UCLA special collections. So Carolyn? Hi, so about that, I'm Caroline Luke. I'm a graduate student in the history department, finishing up a dissertation about labor and community organizing amongst the Yiddish speaking population of Boyle Heights in the early 20th century. Um, my role in this project has been to survey the holdings of UCLA Library um, that are related to Jewish life in Los Angeles to create both a research guide for students and members of the public, um, as well as to find materials that can serve as the basis for our exhibit, the Mapping Jewish Los Angeles Project. Um, and this was no easy feat. Uh, the library's Department of Special Collections alone houses over 1,600 collections, in addition to over 300 held by performing arts, about 500 held by the Biomedical Library, and 1,200 interviews held by the Oral History Center. So these uh, were narrowed to about 1,000 collections that I then gave closer examination to to determine their relevance to our project. Uh, my survey is still not quite complete. Um, I have a couple more things to include, in, in, including the uh, collections at Biomedical Library. But I wanted to present some preliminary results of my work over the past few months today. So this is the database we created to house the findings from the survey. Um, this will then be converted into a research guide next quarter. And all of the fields that are in the database are searchable and queryable, which will facilitate that process next quarter. Um, and as you can see, the categories are relatively straightforward. We have the title of the collection, the approximate date range that the collection covers. In some cases, this is just a year or a few years. In other cases, it's sort of a broad swath of someone's life. Um, we have the geographic scope. By default, all of the collections we include, of course, are relevant to Los Angeles, so that's there. And then if it uh, relates to a particular neighborhood or another part of Southern California, that's included as well. Um, we have the language of the materials. Uh, we have information about whether the collection is processed, whether there's a finding <coughs> aid, um, and whether there's clear documentation in the finding aid of the collection being Jewish. Um, there's also two boxes for identifying the theme that the collection addresses, you can see primary and secondary themes. We started with 12 of these themes, business, industry, and labor, organizational life, religious life, politics and public service, social movements, refugees and survivors, UCLA, education, both Jewish and non-Jewish, the built environment, literature and publishing, visual, performing, and media arts, and sports. Um, and in the future, we could add more categories or potentially a tertiary uh, theme category. The advantage of these themes is it allows us to query the collections and bundle them so that when we create the research guide, we'll have sort of automatic information there that we can just sort of funnel in. Um, we also have this box below, surveyors additional comments. 
um, this is really my domain. It's the space for this person surveying the collection um, to describe its relevance, to maybe explain why it's been included. Um, you know, Alice McGrath is not an obvious candidate for mapping to <laughs> Los Angeles, but she was born in Greenfield and was also intimately involved in the Sleepy Lagoon Defense Committee, um, which I can talk about more. Um, in this box, we're sort of identifying the significant materials, making some comment on the, collect the, the collection's searchability and its condition. Um, in some cases, I've literally narrowed it down to the individual boxes that are particularly relevant. Um, in other cases, more sort of generally describing uh, the collection's holdings. So this database now includes 401 entries. There's at least 200, or no, 200, 25 to 30 more that I will be entering later this week. Um, but even the results thus far reveal some really obvious trends and characteristics about the library's holdings. Um, the languages represented are actually surprisingly limited. Only five of the collections included include Hebrew language materials. Only one includes Yiddish language materials. 14 include materials in German, in part because of the large emigre community that was here. Two in Russian, nine in Spanish, one in Polish, and eight in French. Now, this is not to say the library doesn't hold materials in these languages. That, that is by no means true. Um, just to say that the archival collections that we've found to be relevant to Jewish Los Angeles um, are composed primarily of English language materials. Uh, the themes addressed also have some really sort of obvious uh, trends here. As you can see, the representation for visual performing and media arts is just outstanding. Um, almost half of the collections surveyed address those themes. Uh, politics and public service and social movements are also well represented here. You can see those are sort of the second largest holdings. Um, several of the collections are from former members of the UCLA faculty, which helps to explain UCLA's strong representation. Uh, there are also lots of collections that address some aspect of Los Angeles' built environment, whether that be maps, architectural plans, or photos. Um, there are fairly strong holdings about business, industry, and labor. Uh, literature and publishing, as well as education. But the survey also revealed some clear gaps in UCLA's holdings, particularly in regard to Los Angeles' Jewish organizational and religious life. Um, and we hope that by identifying these gaps, we can encourage the UCLA library to target those areas in future acquisitions. Uh, the collections also have a very clear chronological focus in the 20th century. There are only a very few collections with materials from the 19th century, but an abundance of collections from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, I mean, this graph is fairly clear in its portrayal here. Uh, the concentration in this period, in part, uh, relates to the preponderance of the collections related to the visual media and performing arts. Virtually all of those materials are from the mid-century, in part because the 1930s to the 1970s was really a golden age, not just for Hollywood and the film industry, but also for LA's art scene more broadly. Uh, one have called it the cool school of the 60s. <laughs> Hollywood accordingly emerges as a clear trend in the locations represented by the collections in the libraries. <laughs> you can see there's a lot there. But importantly, not all of those 186 collections in visual, media, and performing arts are from Hollywood, right? These are only 95. That's about half of those collections of visual, media, and performing arts. So it's really not just film that's represented in that category. Um, but nonetheless, as you can see here, some of the other parts of Los Angeles aren't as well represented, particularly Boyle Heights, my favorite region, uh, only has nine real collections that are relative, or related there, um, which doesn't give us as much to work with necessarily in creating some of our exhibits. Um, so again, this survey is designed to both help our project and the library. Oh, down? Okay. Um, our project is designed to help both, uh, both our project and the library itself. It helps us to see what's available here um, to document the rich history of the Jewish community in LA, information that we will then capture in a digital research guide that I'll be creating next quarter. It also helps us to identify what isn't here, um, allowing the library to direct their energy into, into acquiring materials that will help to fill some of those gaps. So our goal is really actually to help the library to figure out what they're really missing. Um, and one of the big problems we came across, as a matter of fact, was in the way these collections are described and tagged. Only 74 of the 401 collections included here actually mention the word Jewish in the description of what's in the collection. Um, now, that part of that is about the way these collections are processed. It has all sorts of issues. But 
even when it seems obvious and implicit sometimes, you know, this man survived the Holocaust, it won't say the word Jewish, and as a result, these collections end up hidden in that way. You, know, you can't query them. Um, so this is another thing, aspect of our project that we're hoping to help the library with and help increase accessibility to these materials. Um, and perhaps most importantly, the survey has allowed us to discover some of the amazing and wonderful collections that are here that have been right under our noses the whole time. So this is perhaps my favorite find thus far. Um, some of you may have heard about him before because I've been gushing about him for a while. This is Hugo Ballin. Um, he was a set designer and a muralist, uh, born in New York to parents of German Jewish ancestry who were wealthy enough to begin his art education at seven years old. By the age of 18, his talents earned him a scholarship to the Art Students League in New York. And by the age of 25, he had won his first award from the National Academy of Design for his portraiture and earned himself a reputation as a figure painter in New York. So in 1921, when Samuel Goldwyn wanted to bring his film studio out to Los Angeles, he enlisted Ballin to be his original art director. Ballin moved to LA and made his home in the Pacific Palisades. Over the course of his career as an art designer and a set designer in LA, he worked on over 100 productions. He also was a novelist, and his collection includes manuscripts for some 40 novels that he wrote, um, most of which were not published. <laughs> but perhaps his most memorable works were his murals. So this first picture here is the lobby at the Los Angeles Times building that he did when the Times was redone. You can see the images of sort of printing. Um, his work frequently offered sort of historical tableaus. He painted a mural depicting the history of science at the LA Medical Center. Um, another exploring the Treaty of Cahuenga and the history of Los Angeles at the Times Guarantee Building. Um, perhaps his most famous work that some of you may be familiar with is at the Wilshire Boulevard Temple. It's called The History of the Jews um, and sort of flanks the interior walls of the temple. Um, these are not the best pictures of this mural, but I wanted to really showcase the vibrancy of the colors and the scale of his work. I mean, these are just enormous murals. Um, he painted the mural during the temple's construction in 1929, which we'll hear a little more about later. Um, and it was renamed the Warner Memor Memorial Murals to honor the patronage of the Warner Brothers, who were members of the temple that funded the project. <coughs> Here's another of his famous works. Um, it's called the Four Freedoms, based on Roosevelt's Four Freedoms speech that he gave just before the US entered World War II. Ironically, that speech was just a State of the Union address, which is sort of hilarious considering how mundane most of them are. Um, but as you can see here, Ballin has chosen to sort of depict the four freedoms. You've got freedom of speech here, freedom of religion, freedom from want with California's agricultural abundance, and freedom from fear at the end. Um, and apparently this mural is literally hidden um, in that uh, they cover it during city council meetings which I learned is actually because the donkey, if you can see him, apparently appears right behind the mayor. <laughs> so the ears kind of stick out and the mayor doesn't like it, so they cover it during meetings. Maybe a little joke on Ballin's part, we don't know, but it gets covered, so it's been literally hidden. Um, there's also uh, Ballin's work at the Rotunda at the Griffith Observatory, which is just spectacular. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, and part of the reason I included this description here is that all of the institutions where these murals are make some mention of Ballin, right? They often have a plaque, they're very proud of it, they include it in their websites, but they really only offer these little barely blurbs that hardly mention anything about who Ballin was other than that he was a famous guy, which is sort of odd. Um, so what we found in the collections are just so much richer than that, and it opens up this whole story of this guy that not very many people know about. So I wanted to include some of those materials as well. We have um, photos that reveal his work process. So you can see his studio up here in the corner with those giant ladders to reach the top of these enormous murals he was painting. Um, the photos in the top left corner are among dozens that are sort of of his actual process by which he did his sketches. He'd take pictures of himself or his wife in sort of action poses and then transpose them onto his murals. This one is him driving a stagecoach, right, that later appeared in his mural in the history of Los Angeles. Um, we also have his uh, sort of notes on his sketches and little booklets that he would write up explaining what his murals were about, which for a researcher are just invaluable sources of information and really, honest to God, are not available anywhere other than here. 
Um, and of course, there's personal ephemera. There's pictures of his house, pictures of his house in Florence. There's family photos. This is actually from a sketchbook, one of his childhood sketchbooks. And if you can't read it, it says he was six years old when he drew this. Um, so you can tell this man was clearly kind of a savant that way. I'm sure his family knew why they gave him art classes so early. Um, so, you know, Balin's Collections offers a great example of sort of the treasure trove that UCLA Special Collections can offer. Um, and really just, you know, hopefully an exhibit on him will bring some more attention to those areas. I have a friend who studies murals in uh, Long Beach who had never even heard of him and perhaps she'll include him in one of her next projects. Um, but the materials housed in Special Collections are by no means limited to photographs and manuscripts. There's also uh, over 50 collections that include scripts. There's 16 that include maps and blueprints. Almost 70 include audio and visual materials. Um, and at least 35 include sheet music and scores. So I wanted to give you a quick example of one of those before I finish. Um, this is one of dozens of scores housed in the Nina Koshetz collection. Um, Koshetz was born in Kiev and became a star of the Russian opera in Moscow. She had, she had sang leading roles in opera houses across Europe and Russia in the 20s, um, often accompanied by Sergei Rachmaninoff, with whom she allegedly had an affair. Um, I don't know if that story is true, but if you've ever heard Opus 38, Rachmaninoff's Opus 38, those are songs for her, and trust me, they're love songs. <laughs> Too beautiful not to be. Um, she came to America after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 um, and toured with companies in Detroit, Chicago, and New York. Um, in 1934, she came to Los Angeles and opened a Russian restaurant, which collapsed, um, and then a music salon in Laguna Beach where she taught singing lessons for the rest of her life. She has a few bit parts in Hollywood movies as well. So this I wanted to show, the, this is actually her singing a selection from the very score where the go. So this score right here, Eastern Romance, by Rimsky Kosakov. This is actually what she's singing. So I wanted to use this because I think it's an example of what we can do with this project, right? We don't have in the collection um, this crochet singing, but we have it online, um, and it allows us to potentially create sort of live links that will have the exact music score and her singing it. Um, but she's kind of wanted me to hear it. Um, she's known for her Russian melancholy. of how this survey has aided both the library and our project. Um, these are sort of forgotten characters in Los Angeles Jewish history um, who certainly merit further study. Um, and what they also have in common is that if you went to the library's catalog or the online archive of California where the digital finding aids are housed, and you searched Jewish, neither one of these collections would show up. So really what this survey has allowed us to do is find these sort of hidden collections both to enhance the library's accessibility um, and, as my friend Karen will describe, to turn them into digital exhibits that will help to draw some public and scholarly attention to the wonder housed here. Yeah. some of the ways we've utilized the collections that we've found. And so Karen is going to showcase a couple of the digital exhibitions that we've created based on these newly found materials. And uh, Patrick and Karen will also showcase, I think, a little bit about the role that they've played um, in helping to create them. So Karen, the floor is yours. OK, thank you. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, if you can't, just wave, and I'll, I'll speak a little louder. Um, so just to follow up with uh, what Caroline was saying, you know, these are great treasures that we are finding. And uh, this project is really a way uh, 
the Mapping Jewish LA project is really a way to serve a very broad audience um, and it's very appropriate here at UCLA as a public university. So we're serving students, uh, providing research opportunities and teachers uh, who want to you know, use this material in their classroom, uh, researchers, scholars, and the general public, people who are curious or like to know more and can't necessarily come in and search through the archives, um, we're going to kind of bring the archives to you. And that's what we're trying to do with um, these exhibits. Um, so just to talk a little generally about what we call exhibits, uh, right now we have three up here and more on the way. Um, it's really a way of sampling these uh, collections, starting primarily here at UCLA, but going more broadly with our other community partners, and then contextualizing those materials um, in, you know, in the in the specific context of Jewish LA and the larger context of Los Angeles and even further beyond that. So it really brings attention to these hidden stories. Um, I mean, Hugo Ballin was obviously an incredibly busy man in his lifetime, uh, and yet there's no book about him. There's nobody studying him. Uh, why did he disappear? Hopefully we're going to provoke somebody into <laughs> asking and answering those questions. So it increases the access um, to these archives and uh, you, hopefully the use of the archives. And what we're doing by uh, this series of exhibits focusing on all different kinds of subjects is we're creating a geographic mapping of where Jewish Angelinos have been on the landscape of Los Angeles. So we're really you know, putting them physically on the map in this place. Um, and that's going to create, it is creating a foundation uh, for building something that's very near and dear to my heart. It's my particular area of research, which is social networks. We will be able to create a social map on, based on these, this geographic map that we're creating. And then we're really going to be into the realm of creating original research. We're going to be able to see things that wouldn't be able to be seen otherwise. Uh, because the chances of any researcher connecting these different uh, collections, these different stories in the way that we're going to is, well, up until the digital age would have been nearly, would have been impossible and wouldn't be something that would occur to most people except Todd's a very ambitious guy and uh, so we're going to do it. Um, uh, so we're going to see, we're going to see how Jewish LA worked and works. Um, and uh, lastly, these exhibits are really a vehicle for creating contact and dialogue. Uh, between scholars, uh, students, uh, living witnesses to the history that we're presenting, the general public. And I'll tell you how exactly that dialogue is going to work in, in a second. So I'm going to take you through one, um, uh, one of our um, exhibits that actually uh, had the advantage of uh, UCLA already having digitized quite a number of the artifacts in the uh, exhibit, so in the collection. But again, this is a person who was incredibly influential in person and is almost, you know, unknown today. Um, and we call him Hollywood's architect. His name was S. Charles Lee, born Levy. Um, and he, uh, he, he was an architect of uh, movie theaters. Um, and so one of, the, um, one of the features of all of our um, exhibits is, a, is, is we map. We map uh, where he built his theaters. Now this is just a subset, a small subset of his theaters. He built over 250 theaters in Southern California and also into Mexico, which is a very interesting question to me. Why was he building theaters in Mexico? How did that happen? Um, but he, he built everything from movie palaces to sort of local movie houses to drive-ins. That was his, his period from the 20s up through the 50s. Um, and so we've taken a selection of his theaters and we created this map. So you can see it, it covers quite a range of Los Angeles County. Um, and I think, um, so I don't think we have the pictures up on this, so we'll show you pictures from the map. You can do a lot of things with this, this map. So this map was created in Hypercities, the other project that Todd uh, has innovated. And, uh, you know, this all the already starts to tell us how broadly uh, Jews uh, were in, in uh, the physical landscape. So his, and many of his theaters actually still exist. They're not always used as theaters, um, but uh, he's, um, he's still around. They're still around. So 
Uh, here's one of his early theaters. Um, okay, here's one of his early theaters downtown, the Tower Theater. Um, there has been one book written about Charles Lee, uh, but there's room for more. Um, so uh, again, this was uh, these are uh, things from the, his collection here, uh, which is very extensive that uh, were already digitized that UCLA Library did. Uh, floor plan shows how deftly Lee used the space, and you can you know increase the size and take a really good close look of it. Uh, when you're done, you go back to our our uh, exhibit page. And you can move to others. Uh, um, and uh, you can check out several of these. Um, here's one close to home. He, he built the, uh, he designed the Bruin Theater. Um, it is all nicely lit up at night. Um, and you can see how it uh, compares. This is how he imagined it, designed it. Uh, obviously, uh, you know. And you know, it was here before there was much here, and right? it shone off across the landscape. I, I'm it sure, because there wasn't visible. there wasn't anything to block it, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, right. So you know, he was he was building glamour here before there was much here, um, and uh, another. Um, let me just show you one other thing here. That, um, these, all of our exhibits are, um, unlike you know, physical exhibits, our exhibits can continue to grow. So we only have about 10 theaters here. We're going to add more. Um, and you just you can see the names of them here. Uh, and we can add more information. We can tell the whole Hollywood story through this story of this man's career. And the other interesting thing to me about him in particular is he's also an example of how Hollywood didn't just create jobs for people who wanted to make movies, but also created careers for people who wanted to design theaters that, in fact, made going to the movies legitimate. Because he made them, you know, uh, special and glamorous enough that it became an acceptable um, activity for people, acceptable social activity. Now, here's one also that still exists. It's the Fox Vulture, and uh, uh, you know we have. Um, this might make it a little more recognizable to you. This is opening night. It's now the uh, Saban Theater. I think that Saban uh, just, just purchased it. And it's no, it hasn't been used as a movie theater for quite a long time. Um, but it's still a theater, still used as a theater. And uh, one of the great things we can do because we're in this digital environment is uh, as we make connections by looking at these archives, we can help other people make those connections. So you'll notice right here uh, that the theater was constructed by the Herbert M. Baruch Corporation. Um, if I click on that link, I'm going to go right to another exhibit that we put up, and we're going to we're going to go through this uh, exhibit uh, in more detail in a second. Um, but that's a collect that's a connection that only a researcher who had gone through both of these archives would ever make, and they'd have to have a pretty good memory to do that as well. Um, so uh, that just gives you sort of a basic, um, a basic look at how we put these um, archives together. The next one we're going to go through, I'm going to have Patrick help, help navigate me around so I don't have to keep trying to look at the screen and figure out what I'm doing while I talk to you about it. Um, so we're going to go back to, actually, we're, gonna, I think we're just going to go over to the building Metropolis, right? We can just start there. But do, can access all of the exhibits through the Mapping to HLA. Um, the, the next one we're going to do is from the bowl to the boulevard, um, but we've already got it loaded up here, and Patrick's going to take over the navigation while I talk. Um, and Patrick and Andy really put together uh, this, this site in terms of uh, how we navigate and what we see. And we're excited about it because we're moving into another area where most of our exhibits have been primarily, we focus on the maps and we focus on photographs. And in this uh, exhibit, we're going a little bit further and bringing in some documents and some other materials as well. So we have this great, uh, from a promotion booklet, we have this great list <laughs> excuse me, of 
the Baruch Corporation's work. Now, the Herbert M. Baruch Corporation was a general contractor, started in 1920 by Herbert Baruch, and they, it became the, arguably one of the largest general contractors in Southern California, uh, and it was active until 1955. And they built many, many landscapes, uh, landmarks uh, around Los Angeles. So, and this is a map of basically as many of those um, projects as we could find actual addresses for. Uh, so you can see he was all over the county, uh, up in the Santa Ana Valley, down into Torrance. Uh, did do some work up in San Francisco. The bulk of his work was in Southern California and primarily in uh, Los Angeles. So, and here's a couple of clever things we can do. Here he built Mercy, uh, Mira Hershey Hall, and here's a photograph of that loop attached to the map. So you, you can get the address and you can see the place. Um, in Cedars of Lebanon, he built Cedars of Lebanon. We'll give you some more details about this in a second. But he is, uh, and he built the Harris Newmark building downtown, which was the first basically skyscraper uh, downtown. Um, and named, uh, was built by uh, Harris Newmark Sons. Uh, he built uh, City Hall in Beverly Hills. Um, uh, let's see, what else do we have? Built, um, <coughs> built a lot of office buildings. And, well, he built Ocean Boulevard Temple. We don't have the photo there. We're going to show you some photos here in, in a, a couple of minutes. Um, he built uh, this, this cafe on Wilshire Boulevard. Uh, so he had a wide range. He built, he built sewer lines. He built streets. He built all kinds of things. He built schools. He had a number of projects that were funded by uh, Public Works Administration, uh, one of the New Deal programs. So uh, that's, you know, that's one way to get sort of the big picture of this company's work. Um, and we always give a little, you know, uh, a little uh, information. And in this case, there is a finding aid for this collection, and we put a link right here directly to the finding aid, so that if you are a researcher, you're familiar with how these finding aids work, you can get more details of what's in this collection. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's just a lot of convenience that we can provide. Um, so we have this wonderful navigation interface here of, of these file folders. So we're going to walk through these, these files. Um, Here's another case where we can embed uh, media. Uh, so this is uh, Hollywood Bowl. They did a major renovation of it. Let's all scroll down to the pictures and then we'll start going to see. They did a major renovation of it in the 20s and Herbert and Brew Company poured all the concrete and built all the, essentially built all the seating. Which we think that the wooden seating has been replaced, but we don't think the concrete has. So we think when you go to the Hollywood Bowl, you're still sitting on Herbert and Brew's concrete. <laughs> Um, and you can see we, we can show you the before pictures, the after pictures, and the contemporary pictures. Um, so this was the first major renovation of Hollywood Bowl, just the natural setting. So they put act, you know, real seating in, they built a new shell, and so forth. And again, we can, uh, similar to what Caroline was showing you, we can uh, embed um, some uh, media here. This is uh, Horowitz at the Hollywood Bowl. And, you know, over to the next uh, um, category, the next uh, uh, project in this case. And here, um, Baruch did a lot of work for the movie studios, and particularly did, he built a lot of things for Paramount Pictures, including uh, uh, he built this administration building that's behind this very famous gate. It used to be called the Lasky Gate, now it's called the Bronson, the Bronson Gate because it's on Bronson Avenue. So we've, a, we've taken Jesse Lasky out of the history of Paramount <laughs> Pictures. <laughs> but 
uh, but uh, Herbert and Baruch built uh, at least five buildings on the Paramount lot, which, you know, it's a lot that you can tour, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's open for public tours. Um, uh, we have, uh, he built a lot of civic buildings, I already mentioned, a lot of uh, schools and uh, uh, city halls. So here's a few of his, uh, he built the hunting, he built one of the post offices in Huntington Park. Um, he built um, the city hall in Beverly Hills. Um, and, you know, they recently reoriented that building, uh, the, the entrance is on a different street, but they kept intact the, uh, the structure and the architecture. He built uh, a building for El Segundo High School. Uh, and this is, again, we're showing you a photograph from his file and what it looked like under construction and then what it looks like today. Um, saves you a trip down to El Segundo. A um, lot of hospitals, uh, commercial buildings. Um, so it's going to take a second for these photos, I think, to load up. Right, but the what was the Cedar of Lebanon Hospital is now the headquarters of Scientology. Um, but he built that building, a very solid building. Um, yeah, so here's the this is the building completed. Um, and this is what it looks like today, that wonderful blue color that they painted it. Um, here's the groundbreaking. Um, and these are all, you know, these are all photos that were in, in his files um, that we're able to use, except for the contemporary one. Um, the Harris Newmark building. So here's the Harris Newmark building under construction. As I mentioned, it was like the first skyscraper downtown. And it ex still exists and still in use as the Newmark the new Mart building. So new, Harris is not quite as erased. <laughs> um, and this Melody Lane Cafe, which actually was a chain, but they all were very distinctive. Uh, Baruch built this one on uh, corner of Wilshire and Detroit. And you can see it's really sad that it's gone because <laughs> it was a beautiful building. Uh, but we can show you what it looks like today and what it looked like then. And Wilshire Boulevard Temple. Uh, Herbert M. Baruch was the uh, general contractor for Wilshire Boulevard Temple. There is a family connection, which I don't know if that's what got him the job, but his parents were uh, Jacob and Jeanette Baruch, who were part of the pioneer generation of Jews in Los Angeles. His father came to Los Angeles in the 1870s and eventually became a principal in one of the in, in fact, what was the largest wholesale grocer in Southern California, Haas, Baruch and Company. Um, and they were, they were uh, members of uh, uh, Wilshire Boulevard Temple. Um, and you know, this was quite a, so this is the corner, this, a gasoline station was on the corner before it was built. And we have it under construction. You notice the palm tree doesn't move. They saved the palm tree. <laughs> and there it is uh, after it's finished. And you probably know that it's undergoing a major restoration and um, actually the whole uh, complex is being expanded, uh, but they're restoring um, the, uh, the sanctuary, uh, including the dome and everything. And I, I don't think that there's been any major external work done since Baruch built the building. There's certainly been internal changes interior changes, but not to the exterior. So it's, it's lasted a long time. So here we, here's where we get to some of the documents. So the, that list of projects actually came from this promotional book that he created, um, talking about all his um, different projects. Um, and that's in the file. The whole book is in the file. Um, and then there's some of these letters that are in the file that attest to his um, stature um, in the community. So this is a letter from the uh, associated, what's it called, the Associated Architects. Um, it, was sort of, it was sort of a clearinghouse in a certain way uh, for construction and, and design in Los Angeles. So this is American Institute of Architects of Southern California chapter. So this is actually telling him that he, he won an award. Uh, Amer Amer exceptional merit for the design and execution of works in architecture and allied arts. So, and this is pretty early in his career, 1925, I think. 
Um, so he was, you know, already being uh, acknowledged by his peers. Um, and You're then... You're aware that the Bank of Italy that's on that letter, that, was, that is now called the Bank of America. That's right. It's called Bank of America now. Um, and this is a, a, this is a letter actually about his work on the Mira Hershey Hall. And it's from the Office of the Controller here at UCLA. And it, essentially, it's a, basically telling them, um, you know, well, when you got the commission, I, I, there was some concern about whether or not you were going to do a good job. Uh, but, you know, and I didn't get into that conversation, the controller's saying. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I want to let you know that they really liked it. <laughs> you did a good job. So <laughs> it was a fine piece of work. So. Um, you know, so we, there's material like that, too, that are essentially testimonies uh, from his clients um, that give us some sense of, you know, again, his stature in the community. Um, now, one thing we can do with these exhibits is, is add to what's there, this contextualization I mentioned. So here, we think this is a picture of Baruch. It's, it's an unidentified <laughs> person, but I'm pretty sure that it's him standing possibly in one of his buildings. Um, and uh, we've, you know, added a little biographical information. Uh, there's usually some biographical information in Finding Aids, but we've added a little more, including, you know, that he was a Los Angeles native. He was born here. He was the youngest of uh, the five sons of uh, Jacob and, um, and uh, Jeanette. And uh, he, after his military service in World War I is when he decided to open this construction company. He didn't go into the family business, the wholesale grocery. His father was a, a real estate developer like a lot of the early Jewish pioneers here. Um, so we give a little personal information and he was very involved with the community chest, which is sort of the forerunner of United Way. And in this particular period, it had quite a lot of Jewish involvement. Um, and we can help people understand that Herbert M. Baruch probably was one of, if not the main one, he was certainly one of the earlier earliest uh, Jewish general contractors and paved the way for many Jewish construction companies that have done very well in Los Angeles. So he's, again, uh, this collection has been here for quite a long time, since the late 50s, I think. And it, I would guess that Caroline's the only person that's gone through <laughs> it. Uh, but we now have it out in the world. And again, we hope that it might generate some more interest and in, in some you know, really, um, you know, deserve some more attention because uh, Herbert and Baruch built many of the buildings that we all still recognize today and still use today. So again, just to summarize, we're really, this is really a, a project that allows us to reach a broad audience. Uh, we're trying to make it easy for anybody to access, rich enough for uh, scholars to want to access, and we're trying to move it toward a place where we can generate original scholarship and really offer some insights into the experience of Jews in Los Angeles. I want to just give a little context for Elliot. Come on up, Elliot, and uh, what he's going to show you, because um, it's in a rough, uh, it's, it's still in progress. You can go ahead and pull up your stuff. Um, but we're moving toward, um, not only having what Elliot is doing on our uh, website, but also having it featured in the uh, Autry exhibition that Todd mentioned, uh, Jews in the Los Angeles Mosaic. It's going to, it's, oh, there's a reserved space for this uh, map of Jewish Los Angeles that, uh, a historic map that uh, Elliot is working on and building for us now. So um, it's, you'll see it there and here next May. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm the GIS intern with Todd. Sorry. Is that good? Okay. Um, so I'm Elliot. I'm the GIS intern, and GIS is Geographic Information Science and Systems. And like any other information science, it has it works with large loads of data and point and entry points and it just has a very specific bent as to deal with geographic information. So, and usually in an urban context, this means uh, addresses, and that's essentially what this uh, component is composed of, addresses. And so what we were doing is we were taking entries, and we're continuing this um, process of finding more and more data and more and more address points. 
Um, and so we took, so far we've taken addresses of Jewish uh, institutions and organizations um, from three disparate uh, historical times, one from 1955, one from 1977, or no, 1958, 1977, and 2012. And these are from Jewish community directories and journals. And so this is just the spreadsheet that has all of those entries, the street address, and then we broke them down into different categories, as you'll see. And with GIS, okay, so GIS is a geographic information systems, right? And like any sort of information science, a big part of what information science does is eventually make information graphics. And like, you know, when you open up the New York Times or the USA Today, they have a lot of graphs and a lot of pie charts and all those things. And that's essentially the same idea. It's just with GIS, we have a very familiar uh, medium in which to, to uh, present these graphics, and that's maps. So anytime you see a map, they're not just to show physical characteristics or physical places. They're also, if you if the designers put in specific lines or put in specific colors to showcase different parts, it's to make a very specific argument to showcase a very specific point. Um, so this is just, this is part of the interface of GIS, which is a different system from HyperCities, which is what we were talking about earlier. And in the way that HyperCities is very good and very strong with making, um, with, making with, with uh, handling information for deeper, more profound stories, GIS is very good with load with uh, handling much larger quantities. And so while it doesn't have that strength of going more deep into specific detail, it can show much larger, broader trends and patterns over the uh, geographic landscape. So this is just the base map of Los Angeles today. Um, here's another one that shows some of the places. Uh, I don't think I'll uh, really describe too much the actual technical parts of GIS software or the interface. Let's go through. So this is sort of, uh, so far, more presentation quality stuff. Um, this is all of those data points from 1958 of Jewish uh, institutions. And here you just have the broad spectrum of synagogues, uh, schools, uh, associations, all of those things, 1958. And you see 1977, how it's changed over time, how in some parts it's concentrated even more so. And in some parts it's completely um, it moved up north and 2012, see even more so. Um, and here. Okay, so, and so the nice thing about working with GIS and all these information and all these different data points and categorizing these data points is that we can uh, query them to bring up different layers. So if we gave a certain set of points specific characteristics, we can highlight them in different ways and show them together to show the relationships between them. So our three categories were community and service, schools and synagogues, and philanthropic advocacy and social groups. And those are the three colors there. You see all of them together on one map for 1958. And you see that the, uh, the philanthropic advocacy and social groups are all very much centered here towards downtown Los Angeles. And you see how synagogues are spread out largely and schools are spread out largely around the whole of Southern California or Los Angeles County at the very least, and then community service also mainly in that area downtown Los Angeles. This is the early 1958. By 1957, you see that movement, and you see that the advocacy, uh, philanthropic, and social groups are still very much centralized in that area. By 2012, it's still very much, but uh, there's all that uh, other sort of moving out of of central Los Angeles area. And um, one significant thing that we've already been able to pick out um, from these mapping exercises is that unlike other Jewish communities in, in other places in America, the Jewish community in, in Los Angeles is still, has not really centralized and um, sort of contracted geographically. It continues to spread out. And uh, 1958, this is just separating the, the different the different uh, categories. So this is just the 
community and service groups. And all three of them together, the, different th the three different times, the larger, uh, darker ones are the ones that are more present. Yes, we have a question. Oh, how many entries do we have? Um, oh, so I should, probably I should uh, mention this. So this, because this is an ongoing project and it's for the uh, uh, exhibition at the Autry Museum, this is gonna be eventually pro showcased in a time lapse and an animation sort of format. And so we're still uh, looking for different times and looking for entries in between to sort of flesh out this whole narrative and this whole uh, animation that gets towards the end. I think uh, towards for the 2012, and we only taken this from one entry, it's just sort of, we took three salient um, physical primary documents, sort of just to see the general uh, trend, but I think there's probably about 400 different points for the whole three categories. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna give um, the floor to uh, Patrick and Andy briefly just to <coughs> tell a little bit about how students, I mean, you already saw um, Elliot as an undergraduate involved in uh, helping us to collect data and visualize it. And now I want to have Patrick and Andy say a few words about the kind of role that they played in the project. And after that, we'll uh, conclude and open up to some discussion. So, Patrick and Andy. Um, I'm Patrick, and I'm a recent graduate. And I am Andy, and I'm also a recent graduate and a student researcher. And like um, Dr. Presner mentioned earlier, both of us um, became involved with um, the Center for Jewish Studies as well as the um, Digital Humanities Program through a class that we took with uh, Dr. Presner. Um, up until now, we've been working on several projects, one being the Mapping um, Jewish Los Angeles Project, um, this as well as our Holocaust Project that some of you may have seen before. Um, up until now, we've also been working with the HyperCities platform but recently we've been transitioning over to a new platform of presentation and that is Scalar, which you've seen um, in the two uh, exhibits that Karen had showcased right now. Can you just map around to things here? Yeah. So as Patrick mentioned, we are using the Scalar platform to show a lot of these narratives that you have seen today. And what is exciting about um, Scalar specifically is that it allows us to use a wide range of digital medias to allow us to more um, to further augment the narratives that we are telling. For example, um, we are able to embed the maps that we have created through HyperCities, <laughs> in addition to a lot of the graphics that you see um, around it, um, and embed it alongside audio clips, video clips, um, music, and other types of documentation that would normally be a bit difficult to hash together. And so Scalar allows us to really put it in a storyline that is easy for the, the viewer to understand and navigate. Uh, not only is Scalar a platform where it's easily, um, it's easy for us to incorporate all these types of medias, it makes all this media much more accessible to the general public, to students, and anyone who's interested instead of having to go look for all these medias themselves. Um, the only criteria is that it has to be digital. But then that brings into, I guess, um, picture everything that our entire team has been doing, everything that Caroline's been doing, um, cataloging and digitizing all these um, archives that we have here at UCLA. And ultimately, it's to make it more accessible to everyone to view through projects such as this. As Patrick has said, um, once another exciting element of Scalar is the ability for us to share the, share the content that we do have within our archives, within our special UCLA collections that generally would be only accessed through um, people that are affiliated with UCLA, but through the Scalar platform, we're able to share with anyone who has access to the internet. They can simply go on and view um, the content that we have here. And so we're hoping that in the future, um, more and more people will be able to use Scalar as a digital, digital publishing platform so that their, their works and their stories are viewed and shared amongst a greater number of people. And like an Oh yeah. Mm. And so for a lot of the, the projects that you've seen here today, you, you might have personal inputs and thoughts um, regarding maybe a place you've visited in the past or um, some place that's very, very nostalgic and memorable, memorable to you. And so you can really share your experiences and your comments 
right here in the comment box on any specific page that you can view on Scalar. And so you can just type in, I'll type in Andy, comment title, um, this is theaters. theater. I did say that and before they're posted live, they go through a review process, yeah. just because we don't want people to you know, <laughs> spam us. But nevertheless, if they're authentic comments, they will become public. <laughs> um, as displayed, um, you can tell that this platform is very beneficial to the general public in general in terms of just being exposed to this information that's normally more difficult to get to. But it's also very beneficial to everyone working on it in terms of the students, the faculty, and the staff, undergrad and um, grad students as well, just because it provides the opportunity for students to get involved. Like Dr. President had said, um, it's something that is rare in um, undergraduate studies. And in addition, it's also a very easy way and streamlined way for faculty, staff, and anyone in academia to publish and share their own findings and projects as well without having to go through anything that's too um, resource demanding. Thank you. So uh, just a couple of words at conclusion. Um, like I said, this is a, a work in progress. One of the things eventually we're going to do is have a way for you to upload your own pictures and memories and connections because we want to open it up to the broader public. Right now we're focusing very much on stuff that we have here at UCLA that's been untapped. We're working with partnerships in the community, other uh, major cultural institutions, uh, synagogues, um, and this will also, I think, enhance the project. And the idea is this is a five plus year project. We're in month four. Uh, so we're not particularly far along, but yet we've accomplished, I think, you know, quite a lot and found quite a lot. I should say if you want to contribute to this project, I mean, whether it's personal memories, it's artifacts, it's archives, or also honestly financially, because it is supported right now entirely privately through the center, uh, we would love to have your input. Um, it's something that I think illustrates what research at the cusp of the 21st century can be doing, especially reaching new publics but connecting back to you know, the past 150 years as well, because it's not just uh, about the, pr the present, it's also about the future of the past. So thank you very much, and we'll open up to questions. And we have microphones for everybody here. So if you have questions, I think we have microphones that can go around as well. Is that true? Uh, Viv, there's someone right here. I have a question for Elliot. Yes. On the mapping, are you going to, or have you already included cemeteries and food markets? I think they might be interesting in different colors for different color dots for them. Can you the microphone didn't seem to be working. Yeah, are you including cemeteries and food markets so in addition to cultural institutions, schools, um, community organizations, things like that? If you don't mind, I, I can answer the question because uh, I'm providing all the data to, to Elliot. Uh, the very first uh, Jewish institution that will go on the map is 1855 and it will be the Jewish cemetery. Um, so we will be including cemeteries. Uh, I've done some work in the past looking at uh, kosher butchers, stops, and things like that, uh, and, and Caroline's done that too. Um, that it gets, it gets a little bit more challenging, so right now we're going to stick with clearly identifiable Jewish institutions, and we're going to fill in as many uh, years as we can, um, uh, decades at least, that we can, but we have to find you know, reliable sources um, where we collect this data that have addresses, basically. But, Jewish cemeteries, yes. Definitely. In the front? Wait for the microphone. I don't need no microphone. <laughs> Why not? Go ahead. Um, I, uh, I, I think this is really wonderful. And I, I, it's, 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 uh, I'm really enthusiastic about the whole idea. Uh, and I thank you folks for your hard work on this. I would call uh, into uh, being a little skepticism about that early histogram about the, uh, uh, the uh, distribution of Jewish population in the Los Angeles Basin. Uh, it just doesn't match well with my memories. <laughs> which, which histogram are you Are you talking about the 1958? Uh, a series of dots from 1958. Or the thing that, that 
graphs. The bar graphs that, ca oh, that the Carolyn bar showed. Graphs. That's actually oh. just UCLA collections. So it's completely, it may not represent reality at all. Right. Yeah. It happens to represent what we have here. Yeah, uh, the, and so, the Wilshire Corridor and Bossier Canyon uh -huh. uh, was a, really a tremendous concentration. Right. Well, and, and so part of what we're trying to do with this project is to um, alert the library to places where there are communities and or periods in Los Angeles' Jewish history that need more representation, frankly, right? You know, obviously there's a lot of Hollywood, we got that covered, yeah. so now it's time to sort of move into other areas and see how we can fill some of those gaps in. Yeah, sure. I should also mention that we do have a, a pretty large exhibition on Boyle Heights uh, from the 1930s up already which was one of our very first neighborhoods that we began to look at, looking at cultural institutions, um, streets, personal memoirs, and aspects of Boyle Heights. And this is, I would say it's still preliminary, but it's still a major neighborhood that we wanted to um, approach. And we're looking at other areas, Pico Robertson, uh, certainly, uh, Westwood, I mean, and the San Fernando Valley. All we are proceeding in a number of ways, both on content as well as by neighborhood. And it's really us beginning to try to see, well, what do we have here locally? And then what kind of connections do we need to make out in the community to build it out you know, in the most representative and you know, robust way? My question is simply about your criteria for selecting from your archives. So in essence, what I get, I'm not sure if I have this right, but you have a lot of stuff, 401, things that you found within your archives that you'd like to explore. <coughs> and then you must have other things. So the question is, criteria-wise, are you deciding this guy is Jewish, therefore he's in here? Or is there something more that he had to have done? Well, that's a very tricky question. And certainly, um, we're not in the business of outing people. That's not the goal of this project, to out every um, person of Jewish heritage. Um, We've done a couple of things. In some cases, you're right, it is as simple as this person was Jewish and it's their papers and therefore we are gonna to try to draw attention to them. But the reality is you have to be, as Karen and I both know, you have to be a little tricky, um, both in terms of, you know, as Charles Lee doesn't yeah. seem like he would be clever, not tricky. Clever, I'm sorry, not tricky. Um, in, in not just determining sort of people's own heritage, but also in terms of if you just do that sort of superficial search, there will be a lot of cases where things don't seem to be, you know, Alice McGrath being a great example. If you're just looking for Jewish surnames, you're going to miss tons and tons and tons of holdings. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that I would guess probably 200 of those collections are actually not primarily focused on Jewish life at all. Um, they are collections focused on political movements or, you know, um, Ralph Bunch's papers, for example, include a bunch of material relevant to Jewish life in Los Angeles. So we're trying to be as comprehensive and inclusive as possible. I mean, that comes down to, you know, there's one folder in this thousand box collection that has flyers from some Jewish organization. We're putting it in there. So we're really trying to cast as broad a net as possible. Um, and hopefully the research guide in that way will sort of show perhaps undergraduates or other scholars how you can be, not tricky, creative about how to find some of these materials. Um, because I think that it's, it's a little too short-sighted to just think of this as only collections that have Jewish provenance or only collections that were created by Jewish people. Um, now in a lot of cases that's, that's the case, that's what you have. Uh, but we're trying to be more inclusive in that way. And that means all the maps collections, anything about sort of Los Angeles' space and the physical space in the community. Um, it means a lot of organizational records where the organization itself wasn't a Jewish organization, but included Jewish members, particularly some of those 19th century materials. Um, so it would be difficult for me to define succinctly what constitutes the requirements, if you will, um, but we're really trying to be as inclusive and comprehensive as possible in that way. Let me just add one thing. I mean, we do have, there is a, a, a mission about the, I mean, a research mission, which is really, it is to be able to articulate, and that's through maps, through documents, the contributions of people who I did identify as Jewish uh, in the history of LA, and to understand the significance of the cultural, social, economic, political contributions that they made to the texture of the city. 
Uh, so really, it's about uh, that's sort of the undergirding you know, point of the project. Now, to be sure, it's always in conversation, connection, and dialogue with many other groups. Um, but I mean, in one way, it's a history of an immigrant population, multiple waves of immigrant populations from all over the world, coming, settling, building, contributing to the vibrancy of a, you know, a major metropolis, a global metropolis. How did it come to be LA? Well, understanding some aspects of the history of, of the way in which Jews settled and built and contributed again, culturally, socially, economically, politically, will help to underscore that. And so that's, you know, the, the mission. Yeah, and just as an example, of five of the collections are from the Chicano Studies Library. I mean, if you were researching Jewish Los Angeles, you probably wouldn't head to the Chicano Studies Library, but a lot of those collections are about sort of life and intermingling between these two immigrant communities, and so there you go, so. Absolutely, good. And the front part? Are the finder fades online now? Are the finder aids, I'll repeat questions, the yeah. finder aids online now, so like basically all the work you've done. Right, so the Online Archive of California is absolutely an incredible resource, and it's a testament to UCLA Special Collections that they've digitized so many of those finding aids. Um, as anyone who's been done archival research can testify, to travel all the way to a far distant library and only have the paper copy of the finding aid then to realize that something you thought might be there wasn't, it can be horribly disappointing. Um, so yes, all of those are, to are available. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed in, in surveying the collections that are there is if that word Jewish doesn't appear, mm -hmm. when you use their search engine, their search tool, it won't come up. And so that's one of the things we're hoping to sort of facilitate with the UCLA Library is to figure out ways that we can make sure that those things are included. And a, a mm -hmm. research guide will provide the architecture to do that. Um, a lot of the various institutions are sort of inconsistent on how they do those kinds of tags and what kind of information they include. So if you search <coughs> Jewish in the Online Archive of California, 358 collections from UC Berkeley pop up, but only 158 in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And as we've shown today, you know, there are far, far more holdings here at UCLA that deserve some credit in that regard. So we're, we're trying to figure that out right now. But yes, I encourage you all, check out the Online Archive of California. Really amazing. Oh, comments real quick, Kayla. Yeah. I mean, we're going to put the whole finding aid available through the Mapping Jewish LA website, and then at every moment where you want to delve into the full collection, we'll have a link that'll take you directly there. We showed a couple of these today. Yeah, I was I was looking for the them. Yeah. So yeah, down to the actual box, so that a researcher is, wow, that's really cool. I want to come and go look further. Uh, you can. So. Um, Al. Will the mapping project have a major presence next May uh, at the Autry? Okay. Um, the short answer is yes. We have a wall uh, reserved uh, for uh, essentially a, a projection of what Elliot is putting together. And as uh, I tried to indicate, it will, it will begin in 1855 and it will go up to 2012. It will fully credit that this is coming from the Mapping Jewish LA project. Um, we, we have a symposium on May 19th, in which Todd will be speaking, and then later in the year, we will have a, 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 a seminar focused specifically on the Mapping Jewish LA project that will be held in front of this uh, giant display of the work that's coming out of this project. So it's going to have a major presence. The Center of Purdue Studies has been a, a partner with the Autry, uh, on this project since the beginning. So this is really a culmination of a multi-year uh, partnership. So that you can go from the physical to the digital and back again. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. you have one, one more question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Any follow. idea how many man hours you have in a project? <laughs> uh, how many, uh, well... Not, not man hours, but we know how many women How many women? <laughs> I think probably more women hours at this point. Um, you know, a project like this, uh, I don't know, it's hard to estimate. Karen is, uh, is full-time as our postdoctoral research fellow, so 40 hours a week, uh, plus whatever you do with the Autry. Um, these guys work about 20 hours a week. Um, I often dream about this project, so I also have to count my sleep hours, <laughs> so both day and night. Um, it's hard to tell. Uh, even at this early point, these easily thousands of hours, and, uh, and, and for four months. Uh, I wanted to follow up, if I could, on the question about criteria. 
because um, you know, every project has limited resources, I mean, financial and physical resources with which to work. And it occurs to me as, as I saw this interesting um, presentation today, that you seem to be moving from the periphery, very much from the periphery, to the center. And there wasn't a whole lot from the center, I mean, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the fact that Mr. Baruch happened to be Jewish and he built a bunch of buildings that had no real um, particular, uh, were not buildings of particular Jewish interest, no synagogues that I, well, I yes, Wilshire Boulevard Temple, that's true. But it seems to me that, um, that if you're, as I said, it seems to me that you're working from the outside in, using the information that you already have at UCLA, but there's, information that you would need to investigate um, Jewish synagogues, community centers, um, the early hospitals and what they did and who was responsible for getting them going and so forth. I, I, I don't see any emphasis on that. And I'm curious about the methodology. Well, to some extent, we are being driven by what we're finding here at UCLA. So you're right, there are some limitations on that, but we're, we're also, uh, we also are doing other research and adding information to, to what we can find here at UCLA. Uh, to a certain extent, what you see up there are, are um, experiments, to a certain degree, of trying to tell these different stories in different ways. Um, and. Uh, but I think one important thing to keep in mind is, unlike um, the history of Jews in a lot of other places, uh, particularly American places, um, we're really trying to, Los Angeles, Jews in Los Angeles are integral to the history of this, the American history of this city. There's not an institution in this entire county that Jews have not been involved with in one way or the other. So. Uh, we're we're really about trying to tell that story, uh, which which could be characterized as sort of going from the periphery to the center. But Jews are at the center of the story of Los Angeles, and I think we're trying to create that story. But you're right; it's going to take a lot more work. Uh, I don't think we have a, a mission to try to tell the whole story, but we are trying to get other people involved in telling this story, uh, and we're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to contribute uh, to that story. But you've actually hit upon the real challenge of this, because there's not enough work on the history of Jews in Los Angeles. So we, we, we put our heads together, we use our students to do research, and we try to fill in as many gaps as we can, but there's not a lot of material out there that we work with, so a lot of it is original research. And Caroline's gonna tell you about the next phase. Yeah, the, I was just gonna say, the next phase of the survey, the, we started the survey with the special collections, which is just the archive. And part of the reason we did that was to develop a working model to then expand out into the other parts of the library. So for example, I mentioned that there was only one collection with Yiddish language materials. Now as someone who studies Los Angeles' Yiddish culture and that community, I can tell you that there's a bunch more resources here at UCLA. There's tremendous resources. There are incredible amounts of Yiddish language books. Uh, that story continues from the 1910s up until the present. But those are not archival holdings. Because you know what I'm saying? They're, they're books, they're manuscripts, published works, as opposed to primary source archive material. So the next phase of creating the research guide is, and we're strategizing this right now with David Hirsch, who's the uh, sort of expert on those materials in the library, on how we can fold in all those other parts of the library, which offer, as you mentioned, a much more comprehensive representation of Jewish life here in Los Angeles. Um, it is so large that it creates challenges, and that's the only reason we haven't included it yet. Uh, there's probably 200,000 books here at the library that we could include in that survey. And our poor little database is sort of like the little engine that could. I'm not sure it can handle 200,000 more entries. So we're strategizing how to do that right now. Um, and our hope is that some of those areas where special collections holdings are underrepresented as we mentioned, particularly organizational life and religious life. There's just not a lot on the synagogues, for example, in special collections. We're hoping that we can supplement that with the library's incredible holdings. Um, because as you know, the UCLA library is connected with the Southern California Regional Library facility. Uh, the, the volumes are immense. So I can assure you that we have that in mind and that we're doing our best to figure out the best ways to fold that material in. Mary, did you want to? 
Oh, I'd like to add, add that we're, we're welcoming donations from communities yep, exactly. of, of library of material pertaining to your synagogues. And several people here have already come forward with offers and, student, and Karen students are working, have worked on them and will continue to work with them and to bring them into the library. Right. I mean, maybe Karen, do you want to say just a couple of words about how we're working with community archives at this point, especially as that's a place for you know thinking about long-term preservation, um, especially when these are at-risk collections. Right. So we we uh, you know we're working with uh, uh, we're in touch with the Jewish Historical Society, the Western States Jewish History Quarterly, uh, and other collections, uh, synagogues, local synagogues that have collections. And we're, you know, working in a couple of different planes. One, um, uh, if we can help get things digitized and preserved that way in some of those smaller archives, we're doing that. Um, and if we can bring in collections from synagogues uh, into the special collections, we're working to do that as well. Um, and you know, we're just we're, at this point, we're uh, still a bit uh, scouting uh, and trying to find the best ways to bring everything in, uh, bring some kind of connection. But at a minimum. You know, we're trying to reach out to as many groups that have um, historical interests and artifacts relevant to this story and, and, and make sure that they're being preserved in some way and accessible uh, through this project. And our partnership with Special Collections is crucial to that. Right, and, and we're, we, yeah, our partnership here with Special Collections has really been our training ground. So we understand what it takes to bring in collections, what, uh, what can be digitized, what's the process for doing that. Uh, so, you know, we're learning here and we're, you know, going forward from here. Um, but, you know, it's going to take a lot of time and, and money to keep doing it. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you. Uh, so thank you to all the students and presenters. Uh, thank you for your questions. Listen, we have a reception, which is right next door. We're going to stick around. We can talk a little bit more. And uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you.